Uh, fine. So, hi, I'm Becky. Uh, my background is physics. I work on gravitational waves and things. And while I was doing my PhD, I got quite into things like uh, public engagement, science outreach. So, we've got something a little bit different to the kind of things you've been hearing today. Um, I got a little bit uh, enthusiastic about it. I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about science engagement, um, and possibly slightly evangelical, so, so do bear with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, you've been warned. Um, so hopefully most people feel like science communication is a good thing to do. It's certainly gaining more recognition from institutes. I'm hearing more and more that people are having to consider it when they come to their performance and development reviews, when they come to looking for promotions, looking for grants, they need to talk about the science communication they've been doing and quite often the impact that communication has had. I think that's mostly a good thing. I'm not sure that actually everybody needs to do it. This is one of the things that bothers me. I think there are a lot of people who are very enthusiastic, very good at it, who've gone through the training, who want to do it, and a lot of people who just don't enjoy it and who end up doing it because they need to tick those boxes. And I'm not sure that's the best way to approach it. I don't have the solution to that, I should say. Um, but if you are enthusiastic about it and you do want to get involved in it, there are good ways and less good ways. And it's worth thinking a little bit about how these things should best be done. Um, so yeah, it is gaining recognition and it is increasingly seen as the responsibility of scientists because so much of our work is uh, publicly funded, the taxpayer deserves to know what you're doing and you're in a better position than anybody else to talk about it because you are, by definition, the person who's most familiar with it. Um, I believe it um, is helpful for you as a scientist. It means that you understand your work better if you have to explain it to somebody. And I think it's good for society as a whole because it prevents us from becoming these strange creatures that live in our ivory towers and do weird stuff and it's not the real world and it brings a little trust back to scientists and hopefully also prevents misunderstandings of science and, and a little bit of the, the horrors that you sometimes see around things like climate change and, and anti-vaccination type things. Um, so that, I think there's, there's value to all of that. Um, but not everybody goes to these things. Um, not everybody goes to science festivals, not everybody goes to uh, public lectures. Um, and I, I worry about those people. I worry about the kind of people who, when I say I'm a physicist, go, Oof. <laughs> I hated physics at school. Oh, God, OK. Um, and I think it's sort of up to us to provide um, alternative and interesting things for those people. Because, sure, there will always be some people who genuinely have no interest in science and, and, and even really hate science and research. But a lot of people just don't really have the time or the inclination to go to these typical events. They look through things to do at the weekends, see a science festival, and go, no, nah, not really for me. Um, but there, there are other ways of doing it. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are possibly slightly obvious ways of doing good science communication without doing these large-scale events. I should say I love, I love science festivals. It's a great way of reaching a lot of people quickly. It's just that there are other ways as well. So I will talk to you about a couple of potentially more obvious ones, a couple of potentially less obvious ones, um, and I think my, my point really is, um, is new ideas are almost always a good thing. And when you have new ideas and new things to try out, um, you're, you're likely to interact with new groups of people um, and, and start unusual dialogues that you might not otherwise start. Um, so article writing is one really good way. Um, it doesn't just have to be in science papers, in um, science magazines. It doesn't just have to be on science blogs. Um, all major newspapers have science sections. Um, quite a lot of magazines that you might not expect to have science sections do as well. So I've grabbed this from The Guardian. They obviously do have science sections. I grabbed the second one from Cosmopolitan magazine. Um, and the first article is perhaps something you might expect from Cosmo. Um, that's quite a recent discovery. <laughs> Fascinating, actually. Go look it up. Um, the second one, could an actual real-life invisibility cloak be a reality in our lifetime? Now, I've worked with researchers who are developing this stuff. It is cutting-edge physics research at the University of Glasgow. They're involved in it, and it's appearing in Cosmo magazine. Now, all of these publications are crying out for people who actually understand this stuff to write about it. And quite often, they'll give you a bit of cash for 500 words. So if you're a PhD student and you could do with some pocket money, pitch them. You don't need permission. You know this stuff. Like, you're not... You are actually involved in it, and you are a first-hand account of what's going on. Sure, science magazines are fantastic, but the people who don't have time to go to science um, events and who don't think they're interested in science may well just be browsing general headlines, and that's a great way of reaching them. Um, uh, second thing, schools. Anybody who's interested and involved in public engagement has either probably been to talk to school pupils or has been asked to talk to school pupils or has been asked why they don't talk to school pupils. 
If you're intimidated by kids, um, know that kids are really excited and interested and engaged and they're creative and they do want to know this stuff. And you, as a scientist, get to go into a classroom and do all the fun stuff. If any of the kids are badly behaved, the teachers deal with that. You don't have to deal with that. You just have to bring them along um, a demonstration or an experiment or something fun to do. If you can tie it into the current curriculum, so much the better. The teachers will love you for it. And if you send them home with something fun to do, you get a secondary level of engagement because quite often you get access to parents and siblings and friends as well and the people who didn't get to go to that event. The nice thing about schools, of course, is that they tend to have a very broad representation of people's backgrounds. So the, the school that you go to will more or less mirror the local area in general. So the people who don't normally go to science festivals because they don't think it's for them will have their kids coming home saying, I just learned about bottle rockets, this was amazing, can, can I be a scientist? And, well, okay, right, fine. And then maybe they think about science festivals in the future. More unusual events um, that I have been involved with um, and that I recommend are things like theatre. So I, I was involved with this a couple of years ago. It was an event called Lady Scientists Stitch and Bitch. I don't know if anybody's aware of Stitch and Bitch. Anyone involved? Okay, a couple of times. For those who aren't, it's kind of an international like social thing. M mostly women get together in coffee shops and cafes and they bring their knitting or their crochet or their sewing and they sit and chat and it's, it's a nice sort of social event. It's, it's friendly, it's, it's open. Um, the group that I'm pictured with there are a group of um, theatre people, they're writers, they're called Illicit Inc, they're based in Edinburgh, and they had written a spoken word piece in which the premise was, at some point in the future, a scientist had discovered time travel, and she'd gone back in time and collected all the women from the history of science that she wanted to talk to. She had people like Ada Lovelace and Florence Nightingale, and she brought them down, they all sat around doing their knitting, talking about their experiences as scientists, what they discovered, why they were excited about it. And because we had joined, because we had this sort of premise, and because we joined with a theatre group, our audience was not like one I've seen in other events I've done. But first of all, it was predominantly female. I don't think I've ever given a talk about gravitational waves where it's been the predominantly female audience. Um, but we had people who were theatre goers, people who were interested in history, people who were feminists and activists and interested in politics. We had people who were interested in science. And it made for a very diverse group. And I got different kinds of questions to the kinds of questions I normally get at science events because these sorts of people don't normally go to science events. Um, so that was a fascinating thing to do. And I think it's important to know that when you work with people who aren't scientists, when you work with theatre people or artists or musicians or writers, you get access to completely different crowds. Um, and and I, I really do believe that there's, there's a great value in that. Something a little more mainstream was Soapbox Science. I brought this to Scotland in 2015. We did it in Glasgow first. It's been in Edinburgh for a couple of years. In fact, it might be about to be in Edinburgh. Um, and... Basically, it's science busking. So you stand up on a soapbox, you shout, you wave your arms about, you might have a prop, you might have a, a glamorous assistant, um, and you draw a crowd, you interact with them, you start a discussion with them about the cutting edge research you're currently doing. They chat with you a bit, wander off, go and talk to the next person, and you draw a new crowd. And we did it on a uh, Saturday afternoon outside the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum in Glasgow. Um, it was the day of the West End Festival. So we had some people who knew that it was a science event who came because it was a science event. But we also got people who were taking their kids to the park, or who were visiting the museum, or who were there for a bit of shopping, or visiting the local bars and cafes. Or Most of the people, we did run surveys, most of the people who attended had not planned to do anything science-related that day. Most of them had never been to a science event before. Most of them learned something new. They enjoyed it. They wanted to do more of it in the future. So these are people who don't think of themselves as the type of person who goes, goes to science events, but now, now they do, and we've changed their mind up. Um, so again, putting yourself in a public place, somewhere that's unexpected, doing something interesting, grabbing people's curiosity, is a way to get access to these new audiences, and it's a way to get new information. And finally, interacting with your local community. Not everything has to be a huge theatre event, not everything has to be a, a lecture theatre full of people. You can just talk to local groups. The WI have science events, things like the Scouts, the Guides, uh, religious groups. Somebody mentioned Meetup earlier today. There are lots of places where people constantly want to put on uh, events and provide content for their membership. If you contact them and say, would anybody be interested in science? Pretty much all the time they say yes, because they want to provide something interesting and they want to get discussions going in their own areas. And again, this allows you to talk to different groups. Quite often it requires a lot of work and time. Science communication does require a lot of work and time, and I understand we're all busy, very, very busy academics. But you can do these things in your local area. 
Um, I'm now based in Falkirk, so I'm starting to talk, talk to people there. I used to be based in Glasgow, so I talk to people there. But it doesn't have to be Glasgow city centre. I was recently in a school in the Gorbals area because we know that that particular school sends very few students on to do STEM subjects at university. And we thought maybe if we can talk to people, they will realise that that's not true for them. Um, so there are many, many ways of doing this, many ways of thinking outside the box. And when you do something different, you will get access to a different audience they will learn something new, you might change somebody's mind, and you will learn something new as well. Um, and I don't want these things to become a box ticking exercise. I don't want to talk to the same 20 people once a month when I go out to something like the Glasgow Skeptics Group. It's great to be able to do that, but why is it the same 20 people? Where is everybody else? So that's all something to think about, and I would say that any new idea is worth thinking about and exploring. Um, so I'm been quite quick. Um, if your research is taxpayer funded, the taxpayer gets to know about it. And we've, we've talked about this a lot today, but when things are behind paywalls, that's a big barrier. Even if you can get past a paywall or there isn't a paywall, unless you have an advanced degree in the area, you're probably not going to understand it. If I read some physics that's very slightly out of my area, I need help. So I assume, in general, the public will probably benefit from a discussion. Um, yeah, I, I think that there are a lot of people who don't believe that science is for them because they remember dusty equations on the chalkboard and boring little textbooks. It's up to you to show them that the cutting edge research that you're doing is exciting. And it is exciting. That's why you're enthusiastic about it. That's why you're doing it. Um, and it's not just fun for them. It's not just memorable for them. It starts a dialogue for you. And quite often, you will learn something as well. So I would say, in, in that sort of case, more or less everybody's a winner there. That's where I'll stop and um, I guess we'll have questions. <laughs>